Just waiting for your chime, Chair Hansen, your clock. Good morning. So you all, I see you already started recording. Yes, so we're ready to go. I want to welcome everybody to the September 9th uh, Planning Commission meeting. Um, <coughs> to start our meeting off, Janet, would you please lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Of course. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Flag of the United States of America. Um, Janet, will you start off with roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Gupta? Here. Commissioner Santa Cruz? Here. Commissioner Ketchum? Here. Chair Hansen? Here. Commissioner Ramirez is absent, and staff is represented by Manuel Fox and Montes. Thank you. Um, we have our minutes in front of us. Uh, um, we have a motion to approve. So move. Second. Well, we have a motion and a second. Um, Janet, we do roll call. Commissioner Gupta? Uh, yes. Commissioner Santa Cruz? Aye. Commissioner Ketchum? Aye. Chair Hansen? Aye. Thank you. We now move to the portion where we allow public comment to Planning Commission that are items not on today's agenda. Uh, I would like to have uh, Janice explain the rules of how we will do the handling of uh, speakers. Perfect, thank you. And we don't have any um, written comment for, um, for this portion. So for those attending the meeting on the Zoom video conference, we will use the raise your hand feature in order to organize any public comments. During the general public comment period and for each item on the regular agenda, I will ask those members of the public who wish to comment to click the raise hand feature to raise your hand to speak on that agenda item. For those joining by phone, please press star nine to indicate your desire to speak. Please note that members of the public must wait for my prompt in connection with each agenda item using the raise your hand function. For example, you cannot raise your hand at the beginning of the meeting for an agenda item that is later in the meeting. When you hear your name called, I will prompt you to unmute your account and inform you that you may begin speaking. Assisting me this morning is Angela Montes, who will be um, guiding us through the public comment portion of each item. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the public portion for items not on the agenda. Uh, has anybody raised their hand? Nobody. Nobody. Not seeing any. Uh, we'll move on to our regular agenda. And could you read in our first item, please? Regular item number one, owner, San Mateo County, applicant, Department of Public Works and County Parks, file number PLN 2020-00119, location, unincorporated coastal zone, um, and the project planner is Mike Schaller. Mike? Uh, good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, I am actually, uh, the project planner for this project is Renee Ananda. Unfortunately, um, she had um, another commitment that she couldn't uh, make this meeting, so I'm covering for her. Um, let me just pull up my presentation or her presentation. Um, Okay, and okay, come on, look just a second ago. There we go. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning, commissioners. The project before you today is the consideration of, of a five year master permit for a routine maintenance program to be implemented by the county's departments of public works and parks. The Department of Public Works is charged with maintaining various county facilities such as the Half Moon Bay Airport, as well as infrastructure such as roadways, bridges, and stormwater facilities. The Parks Department is responsible for maintaining the various county park facilities, which also include roads and drainage, drainage structures. 
During the course of a normal year, both departments engage in a number of routine maintenance activities on these county facilities and, infrastru and infrastructure, such as culvert repairs, sediment re removal, and vegetation management. Historically, these departments have developed, permitted, and conducted routine maintenance activities as individual discrete actions. The purpose of developing the routine maintenance program is to provide a more comprehensive, efficient, and consistent approach to conducting and permitting routine maintenance activities. To avoid delays and streamline the permitting process, the applicants have developed a routine maintenance program manual, which provides a more comprehensive and consistent approach to conducting these types of activities. Administered as a program versus a series of individual maintenance activities, the county will follow a consistent set of, of maintenance methods, best management practices, and impact avoidance approaches. While the standard operating procedures and guidelines described in the manual are intended to provide the program with consistent approaches, the maintenance program is also envisioned to be flexible and subject to periodic updates to reflect improved understanding of resource conditions, maintenance technologies, adaptive management practices over time, and to accommodate new facilities that will require consistent or similar maintenance requirements. In the event that new facilities, activities, or maintenance technologies are incorporated into the program, the manual will be updated and resource agencies notified. The routine maintenance program is a countywide program, but in acknowledgement of the natural diversity of the county, certain protocols have been developed for different areas of the county to reflect unique resources within those areas. Because a portion of the area covered by the program is within the coastal zone, a coastal development permit is required in order to implement the program within that area. The program, <coughs> excuse me, has eight primary activities. Culvert repairs, bridge and other storm drainage maintenance projects, roadside ditch and swale maintenance, sediment removal, bank stabilization, vegetation management, such as uh, hazard tree removal, weed control, herbicide applications, uh, road and trail maintenance, um, and marina maintenance activities, which includes things like maintaining docks, water lines, the removal of hazardous logs, and, et cetera. The program was reviewed by staff and found to be consistent with the county's general plan, including those policies contained in the biotic resources, soil resources, and natural hazards chapters. In developing the program, Public Works and Parks consulted with several regulatory agencies, including State Fish and Game, to develop best management practices that address potential adverse impacts on vegetative, water, fish, and wildlife resources. Many of the county's parks and facilities are located within the coastal zone and as such the program is subject to the requirements of the local coastal program. Staff has reviewed the program against the policies contained in the LCP and believes that the program is consistent with the LCP and the Coastal Act as discussed in your staff report. With regards to environmental review, the county prepared and circulated a draft environmental impact report for a 45 day public review period as required by the California Environmental Quality Act. The draft EIR identifies potentially significant but mitigable impacts related to air quality, biological resources, hazards and hazardous materials, noise and cumulative biological resources effects. No significant or unavoidable impacts were identified in the draft EIR. The project with mitigation measures will not result in significant impacts to the environment. In terms of process, responses were prepared to the comments received and the draft EIR finalized. On August 24 of this year, the county distributed the final impact, environmental impact report to all individuals and reviewing agencies that commented on the draft EIR. In closing, staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission, uh, first of all, certify the EIR as complete, correct, and adequate and prepared in accordance with the, Cal with the California Environmental Quality Act and applicable state and county guidelines. Two, accept the mitigation monitoring and reporting program and statement of findings of significant impacts and rejection of alternatives. And three, approve the coastal development permit, <coughs> county file number PLN 2020-00119, 
by making the required findings and conditions of approval provided in attachment A of the staff report. And this concludes staff's presentation. Uh, I do know that uh, um, Julie Casagrande of the Department of Public Works is available to answer any questions you may have regarding um, the program. And uh, of course, not myself and County Council and Steve are available to answer any questions you may have as well. Thanks, Mike. And if I can make a couple closing comments, uh, Chair Hansen. Um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge all the hard work that um, Public Works and Parks put into this program. Um, and often it, uh, my encouragement in that um, I think this type of approach really makes sense in terms of providing an efficient and effective way to do maintenance activities in a manner that's um, protective of all the resources that we need to protect. Um, and to that end, um, I just want to highlight all of the um, mitigation measures and the parameters that surround these maintenance activities, which are critical to ensuring uh, the protection of sensitive resources and water quality. So these are typically conditions that you, you would add to individual permits. We've established them as parameters for the operation of this program. And so um, we think that this is a great way to enable the departments to do the work they need to do in a responsible manner. So with that, um, we're all available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'll go to the commissioners to see if they have any questions and I'll start off with Commissioner Santa Cruz. Uh, no, I don't have any question. I think it's perfect. Uh, it's part of the county and I am all for it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, Commissioner Ketchum, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, thanks. I have no record of the Planning Commission receiving any notice of EIR scoping in January 2019 or availability of the draft EIR this past spring? I see now that notice was mailed to interested parties. I consider myself an interested party for all county CEQA documents. I track the CEQA documents page on the planning that the planning department helpfully provides, but this one isn't there. Turns out the project page is located on the DPW site. Was planning even aware of this project before the CDP application was submitted last March? Well, as I mentioned, you know, we um, encourage the departments to pursue this um, type of master permit. And yes, we've been consulted on numerous occasions. Um, I'll let Julie Costa Grande explain the noticing um, procedures they went through, which I assume followed typical um, DPW procedures. Um, so I, if there was an oversight in not including the planning commission on that mailing list, then I think you know th that's on uh, my department and um, that would uh, be an unfortunate mistake, certainly. So let, let's um, find out what Julie um, has to say about noticing and circulation, if that's all right. Hi there, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes, um, yes we did follow proper procedures and um, I'm fairly certain that the Planning Commission and Mid Coast Community Council and all interested parties were notified. Um, I do have my staff from my consultant team um, on the call as well, so they helped us with this process. Um, one thing that we can do is provide a list of um, who the notices were sent to. Um, we did file with the county recorder's office as well. Um, so there should have been proper notice. Uh, okay, so I am aware that the Mid Coast Council got a referral in April. Uh, so too late to comment during that period, but nevertheless, they had plenty of time to read it. And, um, and I, you know, I, I didn't receive word and, you know, usually I would take responsibility for that, but I'm really puzzled. And I guess if, um, if the county is going to have secret documents and they, and there's more than one place that I need to keep track of other than the planning department sequa page, then 
I'm all ears. Where, how often do I need to check back? How, how do I need to become more informed? I guess basically, clearly a lot of time and effort went into this project. And I'm very interested to study and learn from the material. And I will do that. But I first became aware of this EIR and the maintenance manual last Friday at well over 2,000 pages. And I'm very disappointed I didn't have time to give it the attention it deserves before considering the motion before us today. And for that reason, I, I will abstain from the vote. Okay, well, we can take um, a look at who it was mailed to. Um, we might be able to do this uh, live while we continue going through cool. comments. Because um, we do want to make sure if there was um, any failure on our part that we understand what went wrong. But um, I am fairly certain that it did go out to all interested parties, including the Planning Commission. Um, so let me take a look at our files and um, confirm and I can get back to you and let you know. And Bridget and Ken, I don't know if um, you guys are available to raise your hand if you have um, been able to pull up that, those files while we've been speaking. And um, while, while they do that, let, let me just say that um, I think it's on the planning and building department to make sure we have all the environmental documents up on our page for you know projects that will be coming before the decision maker. So um, if we failed in that regard, um, I offer my sincere apologies. Um, and I would also say that um, you know we've got CEQA as the information tool, right? CEQA is intended to provide the decision makers with the information they need to ensure that you know the decisions they make are uh, responsive to environmental concern. And then we also have the local coastal program, which establishes the standard of review for the coastal development permit. And so um, the CEQA document is um, clearly an important piece, but um, the planning commission's review and purview, of course, is not limited to CEQA. It's um, in applying the local coastal program. And so um, to the degree the commission may need more time to consider these issues and to evaluate compliance with the relevant local coastal program standards, um, uh, my department's certainly happy to accommodate that. I think um, the Parks Department and Department of Public Works are hoping to get um, a positive action on this in the near future so that they can begin implementing these maintenance activities. Um, but I'll let them speak to that point if there's questions about that. So in any event, all I wanted to say is if the, the commissioners feel that they need more time to act, um, the Planning and Building Department will certainly uh, be happy to accommodate that. More questions, Lisa? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gupta? Um, yes. I, I think this is a project in the right direction, but I have some uh, questions to get uh, information about the background. How has all this maintenance been done in the past? Because what I see is uh, there's a very comprehensive list of how many culverts are repaired, how many, uh, what are the others, the bridges, uh, and how much time is being spent, the ditches and the swale maintenance and everything. So my understanding from after reading this is that um, this has been going on, right? Because um, Department of Public Works, as well as the uh, parks, they have been uh, maintaining the unincorporated areas of uh, the county for years. 
Am that's I correct? correct? Yes, that's correct, uh, Commissioner Gupta. Um, and the way it's occurred has been on a case by case as need basis. Uh, many of the routine maintenance activities um, are exempt because there are exemptions from permit requirements for certain maintenance activities. It's when you find yourself within uh, the proximity to a um, creek or a wetland where those exemptions no longer apply. And so um, those have been done on, as I say, a case by case as need basis. And um, the beauty of this master permit and maintenance program is that um, we can avoid having to do individual permits um, for each particular maintenance project. We now can establish a, the parameters and mitigation requirements for those maintenance activities such that they can be done without individual permits over the course of the five years. So that's how things would change is we would no longer be processing individual permits for these projects. And, and if I might point out, um, cause I've worked uh, with public works on these various different types of permits over the last 20 years or more. Um, you know, they, they'll come in, uh, there's been, unfortunately, sometimes there's a delay between when they contact um, or submit an application to the planning department for a coastal development permit to replace a series of culverts all up and down a, a number of different roads. Um, and sometimes that delay, because it's just simply a, a manpower issue, we can't get to a hearing um, in time for them to do that work within that year's construction window. And so sometimes these culverts don't get replaced until the following year. Um, so that, you know, the situations such as that um, really have um, driven the desire to, to create a program that, that reduces that lag time so that our public works department and parks can really get on top of maintenance problems, replace damaged and um, just worn out culverts and other types of things early in the year when um, conditions are favorable rather than having to wait uh, until uh, perhaps like the very September and October, sometimes it ends up being this very narrow window of time in which they can do this work um, because of the delays in getting the permits. And so they have to cram a lot of work into a very, um, a very narrow window of time. Um, so that's, you know, um, reducing the delays is a big part of, of having this program. I think it's a it's a very good idea to streamline the process and get to whatever needs to be done as quickly as possible. And that was actually my question is, so there must be only certain months out of the year when most of this work is done. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Right. Yeah, generally it's, it's in the summertime to, during the dry season. So you're talking, depending on how wet of a year we've had, it could start anytime uh, about the beginning of June, um, going through till let's say about beginning of October, um, if we're lucky, depending right. on rain. Right. Yeah, and uh, like this year, uh, the weather has been so sporadic, right? So uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't make use of uh, that time, even though in the past you could. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Um, uh, that is good. So, so that uh, takes me to the, um, the there was, there's a map in the report which says there are primarily five uh, areas in the unincorporated county. Um, so uh, do they, all five of them kind of have similar kind of uh, maintenance requirements? Um, yes, and I, perhaps Julie can um, provide a, uh, a more detailed response than I can, but it's generally many of the maintenance activities are similar, but there are certain resource issues that are different in different parts of the county. Um, so that uh, there might be some specific BMPs that have been developed um, when doing certain types of work in those different geographic areas um, to address things like uh, um, 
wildflowers. The, the, we have certain areas of the county where um, you have wild, certain species of wild, wildflowers that only grow in that particular part of the, of the county. And so um, developing protocols to ensure that no damage is done to those particular species. Um, that's why there's, uh, the county's been kind of split up into different, different areas. If, um, if I believe that's correct, uh, my understanding is correct. Correct Good job, okay. Mike. Yeah, that's <laughs> correct. The activities are typically the same. It's um, the biological communities vary. So as Mike explained, our BMPs or our approaches might be somewhat different. Um, so good job. Oh, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, th that makes sense. That makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I had something else. No, it's a, it's, it's a very good project, but there's a lot of information there that requires us to go back and forth between like there's that uh, link for uh, where the what you call the draft eir is there and uh, uh, big big huge documents so going back and forth uh, so th there's a lot for us to grasp here Th that's my uh, thought on this um, so let me uh, ask you my next question. Uh, okay, so I also see that there's a reference to habitat mitigation and management plan, which will be developed after approval of this. Is that, do I understand that right? Julie, perhaps you can answer that question. Um, the reference might be specific to the conservation easement. I'm not. I'm not sure um, which specific one you're referring to. Um, we did prepare a mitigation and monitoring plan um, in relation to the CEQA document, but um, one of our mitigation um, approaches in the toolbox is development of a conservation easement. So that might be the one that you're referring to, which would happen. Um, after approval of the project. It's okay. actually already been drafted. Um, okay. We're just waiting on approval from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, okay. So, so let me, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that, that is what I understood, but, uh, but this is additional information that it's already being drafted or is drafted. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, let me continue on that. So it says that there'll be uh, monitoring for three to five years to document the performance success criteria, whether those were achieved or not. Uh, am I making sense or should I say more? Yes, you're making sense. So in, um our mitigation approaches, which are, are in chapter nine of our manual, we presented a variety of different <laughs> mitigation measures. Um, one type of measure is on-site mitigation where we would restore um, the habitat on-site. There's also off-site mitigation where um, we might do habitat improvements off-site. And so I think what you're referencing is um, the statement that once you do the mitigation, you don't just do it and walk away, that you continue to monitor it um, for an appropriate period thereafter to make sure that um, the plants grow successfully and the, the, the <clears throat> features um, evolve how you want them to evolve to support the, the species that are there. Okay, so are there clear criteria to determine whether this was a success or not? Yes, there, there are, um, and we've negotiated those criteria with some of the other regulatory agencies like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and then also our San Francisco Water Board and the Central Coast Water Board. So they have specific criteria. Um, and so usually that would be something like a good example would be 80% um, survival of the, of the plants that you install. 80%? Did you say 80%? Well, it depends on, on the actual site, um, mm -hmm. what the criteria are, but 
as an example, it might be 80% um, okay. plant survival. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Or a certain percent coverage of native versus non-native species. It really just depends on exactly um, what type of mitigation you're doing. Okay. So, so monitoring and documenting would uh, start from the very beginning? It would start from the beginning for um, site-specific mitigation. Um, mm -hmm. It just really depends on what mitigation tool we're using in the toolbox. Okay. Because okay. some yeah, sites are some, some sites are self mitigating. Um, sometimes we have to do on site mitigation where we're doing enhancements on site. Um, another tool that we use is off site where we're doing enhancements at another site. And then another tool is um, a conservation area where we establish um, credits. And then another tool is working with um, some of our local partners to help fund their projects, such as um, the RCD's Rural Roads Program. So if we don't have um, other tools that are appropriate, uh, Parks and Public Works might choose to pay in to another restoration project by a different entity. Okay. Um, yeah, because that is very important uh, to move forward, right? Yes. Uh, in, if, because if we don't know whether what we did in these five years was successful or not, uh, how do we move forward to see what we need to do in the next five or 10 years? And so I think what's important about this too is the way we've operated in the past. It's been project by project. Mm -hmm. So we would um, have annual reports based on our monitoring that we would submit for every year. And so we're getting to the point where we have, you know, multiple sites that we're tracking at once, which really isn't efficient for county staff and it's not an efficient use of county funds, in my opinion. So with this program, what it allows us to do is have um, more comprehensive mitigation. So as opposed to doing piecemeal, you know, with 10 different sites, we might be able to put our funds and efforts towards um, a more coordinated project where you really have more um, benefit for habitat, if that makes sense. Okay. So we're excited about the opportunity to, to do that. Okay. Okay. So if, if this is approved, uh, you mentioned that there's this HMMP, the Habitat Mitigation and Management Plan draft that's already been uh, worked upon. What else is to be done? So um, we're currently finalizing permits with other resource agencies. So we'll be wrapping those up in the next couple of months. Um, we have our, a permit in hand from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The water boards are drafting their permits right now. Um, Section 7 consultations are underway um, for Endangered Species Act with National Marine Fisheries Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But we anticipate that we should have those in hand in the next two months. Um, okay. The next step after that would be on an annual basis. We um, work together with parks. We prioritize our projects um, based on certain criteria. And then in April of every year, we would put together a notification package. Um, which details all of the sites, uh, the biological resources at each site, proposed BMPs at each site, and that annual notification package would be sent to all of the agency representatives um, for their review and input. And then each year we would do the work and then um, at the end of the construction we would file a post-construction report with the agencies that de detail um, any impacts and um, mitigation. Okay. So what we, would, we, d we would detail out of that mitigation toolbox um, what specific tools we're using for the projects that were done. So we're getting close. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm looking at my notes here, if I missed anything. So it's it's very well uh, like kind of documented here as to what are the different things, different kind of repairs that are included. Uh, 
uh, in part of the routine maintenance plan. Um, so j just for my uh, information, what is typical uh, length of a project? Like actual construction part? It really just depends on um, what the type of repair is. Um, we do have limits that are set forth um, in our manual. So for a bank stabilization, um, they, the limits were set on realistic, like based on our past experience. So a bank stabilization site would typically be anywhere from 50 feet to 100 feet. A culvert, our culvert repairs are typically um, in kind, um, and those can range anywhere from you know, 40 feet, which encompass the standard right of way to, you know, maybe 75 feet. Um, we don't do a whole lot of sediment removal um, because we have a limited number of actual flood control channels. Um, on the coast side, our, our sediment removal is really just limited to immediately upstream of pipes and downstream of pipes because um, for DPW activities, we're limited to working within our right of way. So, mm -hmm right-of-way can vary you know between 30 feet and 100 feet so hopefully that yep. gives you um, a better idea of the okay. typical linear feet per site okay thank you i really appreciate your explaining those things to me um thank you're you. welcome good good questions I know it's a lot of information um, it is. to take it is. in, but we've tried to do our best to really consolidate it and present it in a clear manner. Um, uh, no, there is a lot of work that has gone in there, which is good, but like even like Commissioner Ketchum says, there's so much information there that just for us to have a comfortable, clear understanding is difficult. So. Yeah, we've been working on this for um, for several years now. Um, it's okay. been a pretty long process. We've had um, we've been meeting with the regulatory agencies and even the Planning Commission and and Coastal Commission for um, a couple of years now. We've had multiple meetings with each um, agency representative to go through, you know, what their expectations are, what they wanted to what they wanted to see in um, development of the program. Okay. One last short question is that for ev every project, like you said, the, the next two months you'll be working on uh, these, uh, I would think, permits, but this coastal development permit would still have to be filed for um, each project or, or as a bundle, I don't know. Um, so I'll respond to that. Um, so what we're doing today is um, asking the commission to approve a coastal development permit that would cover all of these activities over the course of five years. And that would avoid the need for individual coastal development permits. So we would no longer be doing project by project coastal permits. This is the coastal permit for the five year program. Okay. 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 So th that won't be required at all, the permit? Uh, coastal development? No, but um, as Julie mentioned, they need to send, you know, a pre-construction notice so that we can confirm that the activities are um, within the scope of what the commission's approved and also includes all the necessary mitigation measures. And then they'll also be filing the post-construction report that will make enable us to make sure that the projects are pursuing in a manner that is protective of the resources that we're concerned about. So as Julie mentioned, this has been many years in the works for this particular maintenance program, but this approach has grown out of a multi-agency effort to try and cut what they call the green tape of challenges that restoration projects and maintenance projects face when they need to obtain a wide range of permits from multiple agencies. So this is providing an opportunity for us to consolidate those reviews and also a reporting and monitoring process that makes sure that um, the maintenance 
program is carried out consistent with the conditions of approval that will be attached to um, whatever approval the commission may grant. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Are you done with your questions? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, I'll go to mine. Um, my questions uh, grew out of reading the alternatives section. Um, and I understand how this got developed and understand fully the reasons of why this would be done. You know, when I originally worked on the Vallecitos wastewater project, in the first year of EIRs, it was a 13 page typewritten document. You know, you know, that was not adequate, but everybody thought that was okay for the time. And we, you know, we've added and expanded, trying to understand, trying to do the right thing. And as Steve says, we need to get into green tape. And I understand that one too. And when you read the alternatives, you know, the alternatives, you know, there's the project, not doing the project, which is mandated. And we, just to be oversimplified, it basically says we'll do less, but really has no alternatives. So like, you know, if you had a culvert, you could take the culvert out, put the uh, road down and make a ford out of it. And that would have been an alternative to a culvert. You know, but those type of things are you because it's so broad, you can't anticipate every single alternative either. And what would may or may not be a better or a, a, a logical uh, alternative. So when I read the alternative of it, I felt it was on the weak side. And I wasn't, you know, is how you define maintenance too, you know? Okay, my, my real worry is we penalize ourselves for planning ahead. We're really happy for people when disasters hit, come in and rescue us for doing what needs to be done and putting in exactly what was there before and doing everything else. And you become a hero and during times of crisis. But if we start talking about this beforehand, we make you suffer through a very bureaucratic process. And I'm kind of afraid, and not that I have seen it anywhere, but just in my head, please, this is not a reflection on you, is that someday someone will say, I don't want to go through that green tape. We've got permission to do exactly what we have there. And it isn't the best solution, and we might avoid doing that. And I, I need some assurance. You know, we will do what really needs to be done, even though it's not there. I'll, I'll give uh, Julie a chance to respond too, but just a couple thoughts come to mind, um, particularly regarding crossings. I mean, we've all seen examples of poorly designed infrastructure that um, we just don't want to continue. It really needs to be replaced with something better. Um, and I, I think that um, DPW looks carefully at all of those opportunities, as does parks. Um, when it comes to culverts necessary to maintain roads, um, the, the options really are pretty limited. Um, removing the culvert and having, you know, the uh, Ford, it, which would involve temporary water crossings, I just don't think is a superior um, environmental alternative. And it would just an example. I know, you know, I agreed. And so then the I oftentimes the better um, solution is a bridge. But when we start replacing all the numbers of culverts that need to be maintained with bridges, it quickly becomes cost prohibitive. So um, I think DPW and parks has done a good job of keeping the scope of these projects down to what really do constitute maintenance projects. And the situations you're uh, talking about, uh, Chair Hansen, I think would 
involve larger restoration projects, which would fall outside of the scope of this routine maintenance. And it doesn't mean that we won't be pursuing those larger scope corrective projects, but um, you know, we have to prioritize them and we need to kind of make our routine maintenance as efficient as possible. So I, I don't know if you have anything to add, Julie, on that point. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to assurances, we've carefully crafted this program to build the assurances into the program. Um, we have a very detailed specific list of BMPs. Um, one thing that you will find if you look through the manual is we've set limits on this is the, the amount that we would do in a given year. Um, so we've worked very carefully with the agencies to identify um, what they felt appropriate limits are. Um, we've also set thresholds for when we do the work. So we just wouldn't go out and say, oh, we want to replace this culvert for the heck of it. Um, there's specific capacity limits um, identified in our thresholds. For instance, we might say, um, we'll replace culverts when there's evidence of um, deterioration in the bottom culvert or when it's at a given um, capacity limit. For instance, like 60, if it's exceeding 65% um, capacity because it's full of sediment. So, and then the mitigation requirements too. So those are different assurances that we've built into the program. Um, when we looked at alternatives, we did um, consider things like, okay, for instance, so we identified different tiering um, as it relates to impacts to species and um, biological resources. So one alternative might be to not include tier three in the program. And through the analysis, we realized by doing that and delaying work at tier, th at tier three sites, then actually it ends up um, resulting in more environmental damage because um, by deferring maintenance, the, the scope of the repair can grow. Um, so those were some of the things we looked at. And then another alternative was not doing the program at all. And that doesn't necessarily mean not doing maintenance. It means not approaching it in this um, comprehensive, well thought out manner. So you would continue to do things on a project by project basis, which um, results in um, less efficiency, um, sometimes project delays, because we're not only considering things like coastal development permit, but we're looking at um, other permitting from research agencies, which can take much longer. I mean, sometimes we can um, be facing like up to two years to get a permit from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so if we eliminated sites like tier three, where um, it might be a bank stabilization, for instance, in endangered steelhead habitat, um, by waiting that long, the site continues to bleed sediment into the watershed and, and can impact species. Um, so I, I feel like um, at quick glance, maybe, maybe it didn't seem like there was um, proper analysis of alternatives, but um, we did in fact take a close look at things and um, the benefits of, of doing this program and um, really working hard to build those assurances into mm -hmm. the program. And, um, I do have um, staff from my consultant team here who assisted the county in preparing the CEQA document and um, helping us with the noticing and things like that. So Ken Schwartz is here. If um, Ken, if there's anything that you want to add um, as it relates to alternatives and assurances, that would be great. Great. Thank you, Julie. Uh, good morning, uh, commissioners, or somewhat good morning. It's still dark out over here. Um, yeah, the, the, the alternatives, and thank you, Chair Hansen, for raising that point. The alternatives for the CEQA document were really framed around the program, not so much uh, site design type alternatives. You know, when you get to a, a situation and you're looking at specifically, what, what would be the best thing to do here? Um, that range of treatments, there are, there are you know, they're in the, in the manual here, there are a range of treatments that could be, that could be possible. But... What this approach is about really, and, and building on what Julie was saying, is, is regulatory assurances. It, having the permits here, by bundling uh, a set of known routine activities together, we can assure that we'll have permitting for the next five years and the permits are gonna be renewable for five years after that. So it's 10 years of permits. And by having those permits in hand, that's really um, a cost savings for the county and also reduces risk. In the event that you can't get in to do a certain project, the risk increases that, that 
culvert or side of the road may wash out, et cetera. So, you know, the way to think about maybe all the activities that are, that are in this manual, um, these are the quote routine, the regular things. Using an analogy perhaps from, from just home maintenance, you might say, well, these are the things like clearing your gutters and cleaning your storm drain and patching your roof repairs and all these things that if you do and you don't defer that maintenance, it will save you time and cost and your house will run better. And, and these are those types of things. However, if you were to do something a little more custom like, hey, I want to put on solar panels or I want to put new um, LID paver bricks in my driveway, whatever it might be, that might be a little more unique and require kind of customization and kind of on-site design and might require more specific permit. And so this program is really about all the kind of easy stuff and putting all that together. And while I use the term easy stuff, when it comes to the regulatory process, it hasn't been so easy. And that's really kind of what's been um, the challenge over the last several years. And the county, I have to say, prior to us coming on board, um, the county had a very good reputation with regulatory agencies of, of putting together good applications, uh, doing their due diligence, making sure the projects go well. It was just a, a tremendous amount of time every year, you know, to do four or five projects and put all those individual permit applications together. Anyway, that's a, that's a little bit of a long-winded answer. Coming back to your, your original question about alternatives, it was really, for the CEQA process, it was about um, kind of programmatic alternatives as, as you know, what, what would happen if we don't do this? What would happen if we did this to a lesser degree? And not so much about kind of site-specific details or decision-making on how might we treat a, a bank failure or something like that. Okay. Does any other commissioners have a follow-up question? I do. Please. I do. Okay. I have a couple of questions just out of, out of my own information and in, uh, in terms of efficiency. A couple of them are for uh, Commissioner Ketchum and another one. Um, I kind of like uh, Mr. Schwartz uh, kind of like answer it, but I wanted to, um, wanted to ask the question anyway, the last question. But the first question is, um, out of curiosity for me, uh, Commissioner Ketchum, out of these uh, five areas designated in this project, which one is um, affecting your district? The coastal zone is, is the big one, I think. That's, that's my district. Oh my God, the three of them, right? Well, like I say, I haven't, I, I really haven't had a chance to absorb all this material and, and, I, and I'm eager to do that. Um, I'm intensely interested in these issues and even just for background enrichment, but I, um, you know, I, I can't say, I don't have specific questions, I'm not ready. And this has been informative listening to what has transpired here today. Um, but I mean, I don't want to take over. You were asking questions. Uh, okay, okay. Then, then I was I was wondering if uh, the project, as described, um, is mostly uh, dealing with maintenance, mitigation, and enhancement. Uh, is that do you think it's going to be sort of like an affecting your your district if um, in an adverse negative impact? If that is the truth, is this to me? Yeah, to you. Oh, um, I'm not going to vote against this. This is all very promising. I just, I just, um, I wish I'd had the time that supposedly the public had to review the draft EIR. It was for what six weeks or something last spring. I wish I'd had a time to really absorb that and and gain the best understanding I could before coming to this meeting this morning. And I haven't had that opportunity. And I, I'm not going to vote against this. I just don't feel, and as a planning commissioner, that I have been kept informed and given adequate time to do this. And so I will withhold my judgment on it. Okay. And then the last question is uh, perhaps for uh, Ms. Casagrande or uh, Mr. Schwartz. Um, besides efficiency that I noticed um, when I hear uh, different points of view in the project, what will be the impact for DPW if the process continues the way it is, like project by project versus the five-year master approval permit? I can speak first and then I can let Ken speak to that. I mean, um, 
when it comes to efficiencies, there's different types of efficiencies. Um, yeah. There's financial efficiencies, staff time. Um, it definitely takes longer to do it on a project by project basis. Um, other important uh, benefits of this program is really being able to cumulatively assess our impacts um, to the environment and to prioritize better um, and to do less piecemeal mitigation, um, as I mentioned before. So those are some of um, the primary benefits. Um, also not delaying projects, because as I mentioned, sometimes it can take several years to get permits from um, some of the permitting agencies. And <clears throat> during that time, sites can really deteriorate and we run the risk um, in some cases of you know, large bank failure, large culvert failure, which end up not, o not only being more of an environmental impact, but then also more costly to repair. Um, so there's definitely multiple benefits to this sort of program. And, and just of, of note too, is we're not the only um, county that's proposing this, this type of program. Um, it has been successfully implemented in, in counties like, um, and Ken Schwartz, um, we um, specifically selected them as a consultant because they have great experience working with other programs. It's, um, we're seeing similar programs in Napa County, Sonoma County, um, Valley Water in Santa Clara, um, San Jose Water Company. So it's definitely um, an approach that uh, other counties are embracing because they see the benefits. Um, Ken, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, maybe just one more thing on, on benefit. And I would say that's um, work scheduling and certainty. Um, in the existing uh, process, when you're developing these individual permits on an annual basis, you're still never quite sure when are those permits going to come through. And I think as someone mentioned earlier, sometimes they're coming through at the end of the maintenance season, late September, early October, and you have a very narrow window and you've got to hurry up and you got to get the work crew and you got everyone. And you know, that's typically the time where everyone's trying to wrap up their projects anyway. Um, with this type of thing in hand, you know you've got the ability to do the project and start in, in June. And so you can start scheduling your work crews and you can also phase it out over the course of the summer. And what we've seen in other uh, counties is that also allows the work to be done in a better way, in a more relaxed, I mean that in a good way, uh, not necessarily slow or lazy, but in a more kind of planned and executed way rather than kind of a rushed way. Not that you guys have been doing rushed work in the past, but it, it's, it stretches the, 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 the work window over a longer period and allows for better scheduling and really just having that certainty that every year you can go do this work. That's one of the great advantages. Um, thank you very much. I, you know what, I, I, I think that basically what I have uh, seen the presentation and what I have read, it's what I understand and is I like the terms of that you're focusing on the long term efficiencies and trying to be proactive in uh, taking care of this matter by saving uh, the time and energy going back in a project by project. This is what we're facing right now, and with the many different fires in the in the in the in California because of lack of cleaning and and and, and the park and trees. That there is a there is a lack of long term uh, coordinated effort and maintenance of this uh, uh, trees and park, and this is what we're facing right now uh, because of this lack of uh, uh, planning and coordinated effort. Now we're like all being affected. And I, I think in your uh, project of DPW, the five-year plan, this is what I see positive about it. It's just like we're trying to be proactive in trying to make sure that we're cutting the chase and all the bureaucratic effort in trying to make sure everything is accomplished uh, to the best efficient possible. I, I think I, think I, I like that, but uh, that's my own personal opinion. Thank you. Lisa, did you have follow-up questions? Uh, yeah, so the, in addition to, um, you know, like I say, I will go back and, and really study this material because I want to learn more about it. And also you mentioned the, um, the yearly, the, uh, what is it that you, each year you submit first the project you're gonna do that year and then there'll be a report at the end of the year. Uh, how can I be included in that? Because like I say, I'm very interested in this material. 
So um, some, <clears throat> what, is there a place on the website that I should check for? Will, can you add me to the list or whatever it is? The, the department will take care of that. Um, the DPW and Parks will submit their annual reports to all the agencies that they've received permits from, and then those agency representatives will distribute it as, he, as they see fit. So we'll make sure that the planning commissioners receive copies of the annual reports, and we can talk about it as well if you'd like at an informational item or just during the director's report of future meetings. Thank you. That sounds great. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, one of the comments that I heard from, uh, uh, I believe, Julie, as well as maybe Ken, uh, is that the permitting agencies, uh, or we would not have to wait for permitting agencies uh, permits. Okay, this is what I heard. Um, and are the permitting agencies okay with that? That they will not have any say in it? They are okay with this streamlined, so-called streamlined process? Yes. Oh, well, they, uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that um, we're not um, necessarily waiving permits. I mean, we're acting, we're granting a permit for the larger program. So I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as a waiver, but I think Julie was just going to say, yes, the other agencies are comfortable um, with this. You know, they've all put in a lot of time and effort to assist with this. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, uh, there are other models elsewhere that other agencies have looked to and replicated. Um, for example, um, I worked many years ago on the Elkhorn SLU program, which has become a model that other jurisdictions have followed. So um, this is something that all of the permitting agencies have embraced as a way to provide more efficient and effective review. So I don't think there's any doubt that the other agencies are comfortable with this. In fact, the, you know, they've worked very carefully to make sure that the parameters and mitigation measures are adequate. Mm -hmm. And we have five-year permits from the other agencies as well. Um, I think my comment was really as opposed to doing um, project by project basis. Sometimes when we're doing permitting on a project by project basis with other agencies, they get overwhelmed with um, staffing and resources to issue those permits. So like Ken was describing, you know, the, the permit might not be issued till two weeks before the end of the work window. Um, but we have worked very carefully with uh, all of the other agencies. We, like I said, we've been working for multiple years to make sure that we have the program just right. And um, we should have five-year permits in hand from all of the other regulatory agencies within the next two months. Okay. Um, one other question. Um, I can see what Commissioner Ketchum is trying to say about being familiar uh, getting enough time to review the documentation. If uh, this is approved and something comes up that Oops. talk about suspense. <laughs> I, you broke up for a minute there, uh, Commissioner Gupta. Oh, you were right okay. when some, if something comes up, and that's where you dropped off. Okay. So if something comes up uh, that that we find after the approval, after the approval, uh, is there still uh, ways of including that as part of the program? Um, so I, I guess maybe if we were to learn something that um, was to inform us that 
things should be done in a different way? Could we adapt accordingly? Is that, um, and I, I, yeah, think that, yeah. um, I think that's one of um, the intents of the program is to learn with each year, each measure and adapt as necessary. Um, that's why they called it a living document in the presentation. Um, but I think, you know, um, they couldn't uh, do any sort of major change to the program without having to come back for some type of review. So if they wanted to add it, add a category of additional repair and maintenance activities that are not in the current scope, then we would be back before the planning commission to amend the scope of the program. But um, when it comes to kind of learning and adapting within the parameters that we've already established, I think that that is um, something that DPW and Parks could confirm. Julie, do you, any comments on that? Yeah, I think so. Um, it is intended to be um, an adaptive program. I think there's also opportunity if there's something that the planning department wanted to see um, there's opportunity for that when you review our annual notification and mm -hmm. our proposed BMPs and mitigation measures. I feel like that's um, planning's time to weigh on, weigh in on anything additional that they'd like to see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So now we'll go to the public portion and Janet, can you uh, again introduce how we'll handle this? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have not received any uh, written comment for item for this item, but I will have um, Angela Montes go over the public uh, portion of it. Angela? Thank you, Janet, and thank you, Chair Hansen. If you wish to speak on item one, please praise the raise hand feature. If you're, for those joining by phone, you may press star nine to indicate your desire to speak. And Chairman, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. And um, not seeing any, and I'll entertain a motion to close the public portion. So move. I second. Uh, Janet, can you go through roll call? Commissioner Gupta. Aye. Commissioner Santa Cruz? Aye. Commissioner Ketchum? Abstain. Chair Hansen? Aye. Okay, now we're in. There are um, further questions and uh, deliberations. Does anybody wish to lead this? Um, I, I like to go ahead and, and approve the plan because to the fact that um, that uh, is sufficient, it uh, deals with the five-year master plan and is proactive, um, it's coordinated effort. And as, T as Steve was saying, if anything, if anything is uh, contrary to what, would we have, what we have approved, we can go ahead and, um, and revise um, certain aspect of the project. Lisa. If I could ask, um, are you, would you be more comfortable if we continue this item or, or what? Uh, I, I'm not asking for your support in my abstention. I, I just, I just need to make a point. I feel, um, I want to feel more included and I want a greater depth of understanding before I'm asked to make a decision. So going forward, it's <coughs> important to me to abstain now. Okay, so, but and you're not asking for a continuance. My, your previous roll call, I thought we were voting on the motion, not in closing the public hearing, so there you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, if you want a continuance, I would support that because I feel you, as most commissioners, are very diligent and being very well informed. And I like a very well informed vote, even if it's to move forward, we can take the extra time to do it correctly. So, you know, if you're looking for continuance, I would support you. But if you, well, you know, I, Steve mentioned you want to make a point. That's that's a different thing. Well, Steve mentioned something about timing over the essence or whatever, and and I don't want to 
mess anything up, I, I have, I'm pretty sure I'm going to, I would vote for this. It's just a matter of that. I don't want to be asked to vote for something because you can trust us. I want to understand it as best I can. And, and I want to understand this, even if I weren't a planning, planning commissioner, if I were a member of the public. So, um, that's the the issue here. What you're asking is, uh, would would the delay uh, mess things up really bad? I don't want to mess things up really bad. I just want, uh, you know, I've already said what I want. Okay. Do we have any more? If if not, uh, entertain a motion. I I uh, continue with my supporting motion. If I can put that on the screen so I can read it. Mike or Janeth, do you have the PowerPoint handy? Put up, I think the last slide's got the recommendation. Let me see, I think I'm trying to find it right here. I can read it if you like. Okay. Certify the final environmental impact report as complete, correct, adequate, and prepared in accordance with California Qu uh, Quality Act. Uh, accept the mitigation monitoring and reporting program and statement of findings of significant impacts and rejection of alternatives and approve the coastal development permit county file number PLN 2020-00119 by adopting the required findings and conditions of approval in attachment A. Thank you, um, Commissioner Ketchum. Yes. I have a second. I will offer a second so we could vote on this. Okay. So, Janeth, will you do roll call? Commissioner Gupta. We lost Commissioner Gupta. Uh, no, I'm here. I'm here. Um, it's a good project. There, there is, if we find something, we could. Um, update or uh, modify. Um, and, and we need to do this. I'll say yes to the project. Okay. Commissioner um, Santa Cruz? Yes. Commissioner Gupta? I mean, Ketchum, I'm sorry. Christine. Chair Hansen? Aye. Thank you. So it passed uh, three zero one, and uh, congratulations. And we'll move on to our other items on the agenda. I guess that starts off with Steve. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Hansen. Um, so the next item is correspondence and other matters. Um, I think the Planning Commission may have received some correspondence regarding the issue of story poles in the design review district. Um, so there has been a practice in the past that uh, you may be familiar with um, under which proposed developments would demonstrate the outlines of the proposed structure using what we call story poles, which is basically two by fours um, erected on the site with orange netting stretched around the peaks of the roofs to give a sense of uh, the mass of the structure and the potential for it to block certain views. Um, so there's uh, been questions regarding the county standards and ability to require that these story poles um, 
be erected for every particular development or specified developments. And um, what we've concluded in response to these inquiries is that we do not ha currently have the re regulatory authority to require story polls. Um, we understand that the decision makers, be it the Design Review Commission or um, the Planning Commission, when design review permits are before you, needs information so that you can make determinations regarding compliance with design review standards. And so we've issued um, essentially a, a white paper on the matter explaining that um, while at this point we don't have the authority to require story polls, that um, it, one of other method of, of one of many methods that are available to applicants to provide the information that decision makers will need regarding the impact of the project. Um, so that's caused um, some concern amongst um, community members who believe that story polls should be a mandatory requirement. Um, and so we are um, considering these concerns and I'm working with my staff to determine how we might be able to move forward with an update to our regulations so that we could um, come to resolution on this issue. So um, there'll be more to come on this in uh, the next uh, few commission meetings and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about this matter. So I'll stop there with regard to correspondence. I have a question, uh, Chair Hansen. Um, Steve, my question is, uh, was this correspondence connected with anything or uh, any particular project? I think that there have been projects that have recently come before the design review committee that have not had story polls on the site. And that has caused these inquiries and um, correspondence between staff and design review commissioners who would like to see story polls. Okay, so, yes, so th that was, yes. yeah. Okay, so th that's what triggered this uh, correspondence because I was unable to connect really uh, because it was not with any projects that uh, had come before us here. So thank you, Steve. You're welcome. I have a question too, please. The, um, this was, this was discussed at uh, Coastside Design Review Committee but neither the Midcoast Council or the MC or the Planning Commission was informed of the significant change. And I learned about it on next door where residents were complaining about the lack of story polls for projects under review. And the suggestion was made to the group to write to the Planning Commission, sort of like complaining that what have they done or they could fix it or something. And I'm thinking, well, I didn't even know this happened. And um, so, <clears throat> Once again, I, I would appreciate uh, if the, 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 I guess this has been going on since last spring, you know, and, and all of a sudden the, um, the idea that what they've been doing for the past 15 or so years, whatever, uh, is not um, sustainable. And uh, it, so... <sighs> I guess even now, like the people on Mid Coast Council, they, they don't know where they could weigh in or, or it's all just happening at the Coastside Coast Design Review Committee, which is not uh, video recorded and there are no detailed minutes and there are no supporting documents on their agenda pages. So it's all just a mystery. So the more information that could be disseminated, it would be much appreciated. Okay, I have a, I, I have an, a question. Uh, if I understand correctly, Steve, 
you're saying that in San Mateo, and I'm sorry if you had already said that, but I might, might have missed it. This story pole represents the size and proposed structure of a building, like, you know, the height and everything and potential visual impact. Are you saying that in certain areas on San Mateo, that is not required anymore? So um, what we're saying is that our regulations have never provided us with the authority to mandate that it must be done. Um, so it has been a common practice and we are supportive and we'd like to see when story polls get um, placed because we find it instructive. But we also have um, seen alternative means of depicting a proposed structure through the use of um, you know computer-based imaging for example and so there's a variety of ways available to an applicant to show the decision makers the design review committee or the planning commission what a structure what a proposed structure will look like um, but <clears throat> To the degree there's interest in establishing a mandatory requirement for story polls, we're not in objection to that concept. It's just something that has not been in place yet and would need to be in place for us to mandate that a property owner do that. But um, Steve, how did that come about? Is somebody complain because it's been a practice it's been a general practice by the county and all of a sudden it's no longer a practice because? It's still a practice. It's still a practice. And, you know, I don't have the details about how this kind of came, came up. About. Tim, um, perhaps you, based on your discussions, you know uh, more than I about the history here. Who? The, the question of the origin of the Coastside Design Review Committee's story poll policy has, has been um, a source of discussion for a while. It may not have been uh, a particularly public discussion, but there are applicants that are frustrated by um, the requirement to construct story polls. They have received over the course of many years, uh, uh, sometimes inconsistent information about what the requirement is. Um, for a while, the CDRC was apparently requiring people to put up the story polls in advance of each hearing and to take them down after each hearing, which becomes an expensive enterprise that does not really add to the aesthetic quality of the coast side. Um, and so we really found that uh, there needed to be some formalization of what the requirements were because nobody could agree on what they were. We also were concerned uh, that really the only agency capable of imposing application requirements for land use permits in the County of San Mateo is the Board of Supervisors. So we can't really have every individual decision maker saying, well, our policy is that we're going to vote no on your project because we don't have enough information to vote yes if we haven't formalized that that's an application requirement in our zoning regulations. So I guess the answer to your question is yes, there was some controversy over what the requirements were. Um, I, I don't know that it was widely shared that it was controversial um, because I don't know that the stakeholders who, who found it difficult to comply with are, are as numerous as the ones that expected that it would always happen. So that's why the department is looking at how to implement a requirement that is more sensible, um, proportional and um, effective than simply having uh, a, a policy um, that that permit applications will be denied unless the applicant has done a thing that isn't provided anywhere in our adopted regulations or ordinances. Because when, when the county wants individuals to comply with a rule, it has to adopt that rule. You can't simply say, we're telling you, you must do X. Um, and unfortunately, this kind of fell into the realm of um, telling people what to do without having gone through the appropriate process and public input for what the requirement would be and when it would apply. So that's what we're going through now. So basically, if I hear you correctly, is after uh, observation or some applicants complaining about it that the department took legal action to kind of like bring this into a more 
legal format and to request maybe the Board of Supervisor to make it more formal and official? It, it's not because people complained about it. It's because the people complaining about it had at least a portion of a good point, which is show me where it says I have to. Um, so it's not because people, we, we don't always respond just because people complain. We respond when people's complaints are valid. And the complaint that this had never really been adopted by an effective decision maker in this county with regard to land use policy is a fair observation. If only one person had said that, and if they were right, we would do something about it. So it really is, was there a groundswell of, uh, of opposition to putting up um, uh, uh, story polls? It really was more, hey, uh, show me where you've adopted it uh, according to your rules. And, and, and we found that we hadn't, so that's what we have to do now. Okay. Okay, well, that um, concludes uh, correspondence and other matters. Uh, moving on to uh, the next meeting and whether or not we should have a study session. Um, I currently have three items on the draft, agenda, so I'm not recommending a study session. Uh, those items include a general plan conformity for uh, Mid Peninsula Recreation and Open Space District uh, to purchase 600 acres in the South Cowell Ranch area, south of Half Moon Bay. Um, we will be bringing forward our proposed updates to our regulations regarding accessory dwelling units in the coastal zone. You might recall that um, you've already acted on the regulations that would apply outside the coastal zone. So we're bringing back the coastal zone portion. And I'd um, also note that um, the non-coastal portion that you previously recommended board approval will be going to the Board of Supervisors next Tuesday. Um, and then the third item that's on the next uh, Planning Commission agenda is an appeal of uh, COSIDE Design Review Commission's design review approval um, for a new single family residence in El Granada. And that also requires a grading permit that requires your approval. Um, so those are the three items for next meeting. And unless there's questions, I'll move on to the director's report. I got a question. You said it was uh, an appeal of the design. So, okay, it's, I'm just running this through my head. So we'll, we'll be getting all the elevations and probably, you know, it's gonna take a, uh, a run out to the coast side for me. Okay, I'm right. <laughs> yeah, and if you, you need any more information, um, please let us know. Um, I'll go question two. Um, sure. On the ADUs for the coastal zone, uh, has this been run by the Mid Coast Community? But it hasn't been run by the Mid Coast Community Council to comment. Um, I took note when we approved the Bayside version of the changes and trying to imagine what would it be included in the coastal zone because there are some pretty, we might consider extreme measures there. And, and anyway, just wondering if the local community will get to at least get a presentation, opportunity to discuss it before we see it. I will speak to the um, planner assigned about that. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if that was planned, but I um, appreciate your comment and um, I think it would be good for us to do that. So I will deliver that message. Thank you. You're okay, I have, I have a question, Steve. Uh, when you said appeal, are appeal uh, presented to the borough supervisor or uh, can somebody bring back again a project that has been denied and appeal it to um, our commission? Um, so it depends on who the decision maker is um, to determine who the appellate body would be. So in cases of a design review permit, um, well, there's a design review permit. In this case, there's also a grading permit. And the grading permit has to come to the planning commission. So we consolidate those reviews, but we ask that the design review committee make a recommendation uh, about the design. 
In this case, the design review committee recommended for, um, that you approve the design review permit and somebody is appealing that design review approval by the design review committee. Um, your decision on the grading permit and the design review permit is appealable to the Board of Supervisors. So, but you can't appeal it back to the same body, right? So you, somebody couldn't appeal what your decision to you, it would go to the Board of Supervisors. So I hope I'm answering your question. Yes, thank you. Well, um, so that concludes uh, the items for next meeting. Uh, moving on to the director's report. Um, thought I'd give you an update on the fire response, which is uh, very active at the moment. Um, I've got inspectors and other members of my staff on the damage assessment team. They're uh, wrapping that up this week and we are preparing to move into the cleanup and rebuild stage. Um, so I'm working closely with some of the other agencies that are assisting with that. Environmental health is addressing potential household hazardous waste issues within debris. Um, we've got the Ag Commissioner's Office helping out with agricultural structures that were damaged or destroyed. And we've got the Office of Sustainability helping us to coordinate these efforts as well. Um, we, the county stood up a disaster assistance center in Pescadero. Uh, that's been um, open since the pa this past Wednesday, where we've provided information and resources to folks who have uh, had property impacted by the fire. Um, so we've also put up a web page on the planning and building uh, department's website to provide information to fire victims about the rebuilding process and other related information they may need. So um, we're lucky in San Mateo County uh, relative to the damage that occurred in Santa Cruz County. Um, Santa Cruz County had over 900 homes destroyed. Um, in uh, San Mateo County, we're looking at approximately 20 homes, a last count, but a number of uh, commercial, agricultural, and outbuildings destroyed. So um, still incomplete numbers on that, but um, those are coming in this week and I'll be happy to share final numbers once we have them. So we're doing our best to support um, the property owners that were impacted um, and we will be um, assisting them with whatever permits they'll need to rebuild. And that will be uh, evaluated on a case by case basis. There is some uh, possi uh, possibility of an emergency action by either the county manager or the board of supervisors to waive some of those permit requirements that typically apply. Um, in the coastal zone, there is currently a coastal development permit exemption to replace a structure destroyed by a natural disaster, provided it's in the same location and its uh, footprint uh, or floor area does not increase by more than 10%. And so um, that will help minimize the burden of getting permits um, in order to rebuild. Um, so in any event, as I said, we will be helping the property owners to the best of our ability navigate that process. Um, so unless there's questions on that, I'll move on to some other matters. Um, I wanted I, to let you go ahead, Commissioner Santa Cruz. I, I have, I, I, yeah, I have a quick question out of curiosity. If there are uh, uh, structures that, that were built illegally in certain areas of the coast that they have maybe burned, uh, so how do you guys handle that? Are they going to continue on the same illegally or something? Just out of curiosity, Steve. Yeah. Um, illegal structures are going to present um, a challenge. And um, I would interpret the current rules as requiring someone to go through the full permit process in order to rebuild a structure that was not legally constructed in the first place. So 
uh, I'm afraid the exemptions would not apply in those cases, Commissioner Santa Cruz, and people will have to go through the permit process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I had a question, uh, Steve. So it, uh, is the fire mostly contained in the San Mateo County area? I believe so. Last I saw it, they were in the high 80 percentile um, containment. Um, Butano Canyon, um, it was one of the hottest spots of the fire. Mm -hmm. And I think there are still a couple of what they're calling islands that are still actively burning. Um, in fact, you know, from what I've heard, the area within the perimeter of the fire uh, will continue burning in places here and there until we get a significant rain. Mm -hmm. So um, in answer to your question, I believe there are some spots still burning within San Mateo County, but mm -hmm. they have been cr uh, contained for the most part by a perimeter that Cal Fire considers to be secure. Okay. And really no further um, structure, structural damage is taking place, right? Uh, visibly, yeah. That's correct. We, we don't believe there are any structures currently in harm's way. Um, okay. All the dam structural damage that's occurred has likely already occurred. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, so moving on, I wanted to update you very quickly on Connect the Coast side. As you know, we've been engaged in an extensive public outreach process, albeit you know digital. And we are in the process of um, consolidating those comments and responding to them. Um, I understand that the Mid Coast Community Council will be discussing uh, this topic tonight at their meeting and be uh, issuing an independent assessment of the public feedback, which we will be happy to consider. So our own report um, about the feedback we've received and um, how we intend to respond will be released in, I, I'd say in the next uh, two to three weeks. So my staff is working on that and we'll be happy to share that with you once, once it's ready to be published. Um, and then the final thing was the um, non-coastal ADU items going to the board next Tuesday, which I already mentioned. So that's all I had in my director's report for this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a couple of questions. Um, the, just to go back to the story polls, the, uh, there, there was apparently, I got this from Camille, there was a policy revision document in May uh, that says, you know, you don't have to do the story polls, you can do this other thing. And so since then, I guess none of the projects have had story polls. And it's, it, 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 it's my understanding that the county feels that this uh, regulatory uh, provision or ordinance or whatever that needs to require them should be um, attached to the design review update, which um, may take years. And uh, the, and yet the CDRC feels that it's an urgent thing, but it's sort of, it's not clear to me when that decision will be made or any of that. So uh, um, it would be good if, if the MCC could be informed and they could weigh in or something. I don't know. I don't know what, I guess there will be some discussion about this at CDRC tomorrow. Um, uh, my, so am I, my suggestion as a commissioner, this is another topic. Um, I just would like to request timely posting of our meeting video links. Uh, this, in my experience, this should be possible by like Friday after a Wednesday meeting. All the coast side boards uh, get their meeting videos posted on Pacific Coast TV within two days at, at the longest, uh, usually only one. The, the problem is the late posting and the unreliable timeline greatly reduces the usefulness of the, of the videos. And they are particularly important because the Planning Commission does not have detailed minutes. So uh, I wonder if there's something that could be done to get those posted more promptly. Um, I have 
completely relied on Janeth and our ISD team. So um, I'm not familiar with some of the challenges they may face, but I see Janeth nodding her head and um, I think we will make every effort to get it posted as quickly as possible. Um, Janeth, is there, do you see any thing preventing us from having the video posted by Friday? Yeah, no, I think that's correct. Um, it's We've never really had that fast turnaround. Um, what ends up happening is we go through, the recording goes through the Zoom, you know, um, kind of process. They send right away after the meetings, maybe in an hour or so, I get an email that has the link to the video, but I can, we don't normally just plop it on the website like that. It has to go to ISD, which they convert into a YouTube link, which they send back to me, which is what gets uploaded onto our website. And it just depends on their availability and how fast like their workload is. It does take about never two to three days. It's always like a week or two at the most. Um, and so I, like, I'm still waiting for two videos uh, at this point. And so I'll just continue to nudge um, and, and hopefully that'll, that'll get posted um, soon. But it just, sometimes I get it really fast within a week or so. Sometimes it takes a little longer. Um, we, we've, the only time we've gone through a Pacific coast, which is great. Um, they're, they're a little costly, right? We used them for, when we did the um, Half Moon Bay public hearing for um, our item in the evening. And um, that's the only time we've used them and they are pretty fast and efficient, but we just don't have I believe those resources to keep using them each time and, and linking it that way. Um, but maybe in the future, I mean, I could take a look and see um, a, another possibility so we can get those up in a timely manner. I think that, uh, we need to work with ISD so that we can get um, a more regular and prompt turnaround. So I'm happy to take that up. Okay, and, and I have a, a, a follow-up question. Um, whatever happened, Janet, I think we agreed that um, we're gonna put the district that belongs to the project, uh, not for the posting because it's more expensive, but for the for the meeting. Is that, is that um, okay if you can follow up and try to do that, at least for my own uh, benefits? Yes, thank you. Um, that is noted. So for the next meeting, that's going to happen um, because there are multiple items on the agenda. So this meeting today was like various locations. So it's count. It was county wide or coastal. So it just depends um, on, you know. So for the next meeting, there are um, definitely a possibility. You know, I could put di what district it belongs to and send it your way. But I do have it listed. So thanks okay. for that. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Ketchum, um, I think you might have had some other question. I don't think I did. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a question. Um, actually, yeah. Uh, this correspondence that we got, that kind of triggered in my mind that I know that the next meeting we have several items, uh, but in future, uh, I was looking if uh, commission, other commissioners are supportive of this is to have a study session on like a permitting through approval process, like even if it's a short presentation for commissioners understanding of what is involved in that. Okay, so we are better informed uh, to give our comments and uh, decisions. I think Is it's a great idea. I second that. It's a, an, a great, great idea. I will put it on our list of topics for future studies. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, nothing That's more. all. We can go to adjournment. Okay. We are adjourned. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Thanks a See lot. See you next time. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.